Stand by. Three, two, one. The following program comes from executive producer Lillian Garcia. Every athlete is on this quest. Every performer dives in head first, battling real life challenges and overcoming obstacles in an effort to make their dreams reality. reality. Singer, speaker, and 15 year WWE host Lillian Garcia was the first woman to ever announce WrestleMania and is now the PFL MMA cage announcer. Oh, yeah. And now she's giving you an all access pass to the human interest stories of elite athletes, extraordinary entertainers, and wellness experts. Now let's embark on another fascinating journey of chasing glory with your host, Lillian Garcia. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Chasing Glory. And that's right, we are on video for this episode. As I told you in my 100th episode that more and more episodes are going to be coming to you via video. So how do you see the episode? If you guys are out there listening, you just go to youtube.com slash Lillian Garcia. Simple as that. Just make sure you just Google in this Chasing Glory and with Candace Michelle, and then you could see the episode. All right. So this episode I'm so excited about, and that is Candace Michelle. She was at Raw Reunion with myself and with a lot of the other returning WWE female superstars and the male superstars. And as you know, I had my big bash with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Just the whole night was so much fun. And I wanted to do an episode with her because I wanted to catch up with her. And I've never done a Chasing Glory story on her. She's been part of TLC, which is Tori, Wilson, myself, and her. We spell out TLC. And so I kind of wanted to say, like, you know what, Candace? I really want to get into who you are and your Chasing Glory story. I've seen some things on social media that I've been wondering about. And so we talk about all of that. And let me just tell you, this is a real raw, inspiring interview because You'll get to know Candace like never before. There are many things that I didn't even know out of my good friend. So I'm going to go right into this episode. And just to let you guys know something else with Chasing Glory is we're going to be doing some bite-sized episodes. Those are going to be coming out on Thursdays. That's coming up in the future. I will let you know about that. But that's when we're going to start announcing the winners every single week for our little contest that we do with the 8x10 and also the autographed t-shirt. And that is for writing a review. But in the meantime, please keep those reviews coming. We post them five star Saturdays on Instagram. And also make sure you follow the show at Chasing Glory podcast on Instagram and at Lillian Garcia on Instagram and Twitter, Lillian Garcia official fan page on Facebook. Okay, here we go, guys. Without further ado, here is Candace Michelle's journey of chasing glory. The ultimate go-getter, Candace Michelle knew in order to achieve anything, she had to be strong and persistent. Growing up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, she was involved in athletics and even played on the varsity basketball team as a freshman. But Candace knew what she wanted in life, and at the age of 18, she would follow her heart and move to Los Angeles, California to pursue modeling and acting. She would begin appearing in bodybuilding and car magazines and even appeared in films such as Tomcats, Anger Management, and Dodgeball. In 2004, Candace would audition for the first ever WWE Diva Search, and although she did not make the final 10, she would impress the WWE officials and would be hired by the company by the end of the year. For the next few years, Candace would serve as eye candy regularly on WWE programming, where she would participate in bra and panty matches, lingerie, and pillow fight matches. Knowing she was capable of more, Candace would begin training on her off days and would noticeably start improving in the ring. Her hard work and determination paid off when she defeated Melina to win the WWE Women's Championship at Vengeance 2007. By doing so, she became the first ever Diva Search contestant to win a championship. Outside of the ring, Candace would gain notoriety by appearing for numerous Super Bowl commercials for the company GoDaddy that were deemed too hot for television and even appeared alongside Danica Patrick. Due to her success in GoDaddy and the WWE, Candace was chosen as the cover girl for the April 2006 issue of Playboy magazine. 
Some years later, injuries would cut her wrestling career short, and although she officially left WWE in 2009, she chose to retire in her own way when she would face former WWE Women's Champion Victoria in October of 2017 for Tommy Dreamer's House of Hardcore. Candice would then turn to the motivational world and most recently conducted her first TED Talk where she shared her journey of pursuing her dreams and becoming a mother to three beautiful daughters. Just recently, Candice made her return to the WWE for Raw Reunion and would shock the world by becoming WWE 24-7 Champion. It's about to get real, raw and inspiring with Candice Michelle. Here we are, <laughs> Chasing Glory, Candace Michelle, the C to the TLC. <laughs> she has arrived, I'm so excited. Thanks for having me, Lo. This is great. Yeah. This is perfect timing because coming off of Raw Reunion, yes. great seeing you at Raw, Thank by the way. Thank you, I had so much fun. I love that we actually get to live, even though we get to live in the same kind of area in California, we don't see each other that much. Right. I do love that we live here like any, Second, we can help each other out. Yes. I remember with the fires and all, you were reaching out and yeah. stuff. And, um, but I like it when we get to go back to where we were and how much we shared at WWE. Yeah. Oh, my God. For you, what was it like? Well, first of all, I was really excited because, as you know, I wasn't invited to Evolution. or And I think there was a, another Raw reunion a yeah. year ago. And so I was a little bit hurt by that because I do feel like I played a vital role, a very important role. And one of the things that I've really come to terms with is never letting anybody take that away from me. And so when you're encountered with things like not being invited to a woman's evolution where I was the first Hollywood girl to ever win the women's championship, like that's a memorable thing. So mm -hmm. for... Or, for it to be downplayed by those people, you want to go inside and be like, I'm not good enough. Like, why wasn't I called? Like, why why was X, Y, and Z called over a moment like that? Right. But instead, because of all my work I do, it was, it was just not my timing, right? Yeah. And so to come to this Raw, I came with the, not expectations, right? I just came to see my friends, um, a sisterhood and brotherhood that I believe in. Yeah. A uh, wrestling and a cult that I love. The fans that I adore, and just have a moment there. Yeah. And it was actually much better than what <laughs> I, I thought it was going to be. Twenty and our seven title. I mean, that's pretty cool. You know what? It has become my favorite title. Okay, I've only what? won two titles, <laughs> but you would think the other one and all the work I had to do, what people saw, right. that would be my favorite. But in my space in life right now, it's truly who I am. Like I had that title for five seconds, maybe not even, <laughs> but I have the title, right? Right. Like that goes down in history that I had that title. Right. But in my eyes, I have that always. Like it's what I do. I live, eat and breathe being a champion in my life. And people haven't seen the last decade of my work, right. but it always ends up showing somehow in your life. Yeah. And those little moments give you that positivity and that encouragement to be like, Okay, I'm on this right path. Yeah. Like 24 7, like that's what you gotta live. Yeah. Even though if it's somebody takes it away, in my mind, it's not been taken away. Right. It was just a reminder of like, you are on the right path. And like, I didn't even know a 24 7 title existed. <laughs> I was like, what is this you thing? Haven't been watching you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, you've been busy as a mom uh, yeah. of three girls. But isn't yeah. it weird how like that pops up in your life? Like, yeah. not knowing it exists. And then for them to give it to me when I wasn't even considered last year. Yeah. You know, like it's that time in my life. Yeah. And so it was a, I feel gratitude. And I always feel that inner being of you're on the right path. Yeah. You know? Because you've been struggling a little bit lately, right? Because yeah. you've shared some things online that I saw. Yeah. I saw this one video about clicks. Yeah. Girl, when I saw that, I was like, wow, the things we don't know that people are going through. 
right? And I think all of us have shared that at one time yeah. or another, but we're too scared to share it or you talk about it or, you know, be vulnerable. And you allowed yourself to be vulnerable. Was it Ashley that the passing of Ashley that led you to that moment? To yes. Say, yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, I know we've spoken in our sisterhood how her passing really affected all of us. Yeah. And it affected me on a level I never, I mean, I never expected that to happen, but the way I was affected is I'm so talented in what I do and nobody out there knows about it. Mm. Because I have all these programs too and these things that I need to get organized and I put off. And then what if I could have, what if I could have helped her? Mm. What if one of my videos could have helped her? What if it could help one of the millions of people that suffer from this. Right. And it was so hard to do that video. Like yeah. filming it was fine, right? I'm by myself, my husband's filming it. I'm like, yeah. it's fine. But when I released that to the world, and I, I view myself as being really raw and authentic and vulnerable, but that's a different level. Like yeah. when you really go there, like I was like, take it down, take it down. And my husband's like, don't take it down. And I'm like, take it down. <laughs> They're not gonna wanna see it. Like I look like a fool, I look crazy, you know? Like all those manahunis pop up so fast. Yeah. And like I didn't even eat all day and I was like, wow, I haven't been vulnerable at all. Like that is like a deep level and the response is what blew me away. Like literally blew me away. Yeah. Talk to me about what you shared in that for maybe some people that haven't seen the video um, and what, uh, what you got out of it. So for me, in my personal life, I experience highs and lows. Um, I feel like it's a lot of reasons. It's my career. You know, I don't work a steady job nine to five where I need to wake up at eight every day and be here. So I need to create that schedule also in the entertainment or entrepreneurial world, yeah. you know, like you get successes, you get a title, it's five seconds, and then you're back to being normal. You know, so like these highs and lows, like learning how to balance them and finding the tools has been a journey of a lifetime for me. But this last year, I had a couple lows that were in a very, very scary place. And they're not triggered by big things, big events. It's not like I've, you know, got a divorce or I lost a, a friend or a family member, you know, it's like yeah. something that just kind of like snaps and I feel like clicks. It was the best way I could describe it. Like I'm going down, I'm going down. And then usually I'm with my husband and he doesn't know how to communicate with me and it's going down, it's going down. And then I'm there. Mm. And in this place, it's so scary. It's um it's like you can see the outside but you're trapped. You know? And you can't make decisions down there. You can't you just think bad bad thoughts. And so when Ashley passed, I could envision her being there. Yeah. You know, and I'm um I use very different tools in my life. You know me as being really holistic, organic. Um, and so when Ashley passed, I felt how can I hold all these things that get me out of there from other people? Because people don't know about this stuff. Right. But I can't share the tools if I don't share my discoveries, right? Yeah. And so Ashley was a gift for me because I didn't know it was a gift when I was in that spot. You yeah. know, it's like, why have I gone here three times in one year? Yeah. And I had to do research on myself. Yeah. You know, it's like, I know how scary that place is when you just think the worst possible things and you don't have control over those decisions. Like, you something clicks. It just clicks into a very scary place. Were you, would you say you were suicidal at that point? I wouldn't say it was suicidal, but you think those thoughts. Yeah. For me, that's yeah. where I was. So I think it's 
the gratitude that I have a beautiful family. I have a great husband. I'm happily married. Like my life is really great. And and that's even a testament to those people that have a great life. Like that still happens to me, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's not over a life crisis, you know? It's like maybe a little argument and it just kind of trickled down. And so to be in that place when you see bad things, when you have children and you have a husband and a great home and all this stuff, it's like, why am I going there? Yeah. And how can I help other people from did, going there? Did you discover, because I'm here, you have your three beautiful daughters, yes. and I'm sure that they help you a lot, but you know, somebody to, to help somebody understand, you said it, you have a beautiful family, amazing supportive husband, your, your daughters are adorable. What takes you there? Well, so because you have a beautiful home, you're people right. think it's money. That money buys you happiness, right? You've got security as far as a home. You've got food every single day. Some people will yeah. be like, "Candace, you've got the life. Like, yeah. why would you even think those things?" So what I have found is when you're not living your purpose, yeah. like truly, and I had to discover that place because, like, I'm a champ coach, like. I am really, really good at what I do and what I know, but nobody knows it but my inner circle, right? Yeah. And I had to go down there, so I think I had to experience that because you can't help somebody with something like that if you don't know what it's like. Right. And it's a different level. Like, I talk with some of my friends about it, and even though they've experienced depression, it's not that space. It's not that space where you have no control. That space is different, you yeah. know? And to be able to help people with that I had to see it, mm. and I, I've actually it's funny because my uh, coaching plan that I, I'm we'll talk about that later that yeah. I've come up with. But what I love that wrestling taught me, it's like the heat of the match brings you the best comeback. <laughs> That's right? true. Right? That's true. And when I look back at my wrestling career, what was I good at? I was good at selling. Yeah. It wasn't my comebacks or fancy moves. It was I could put Beth Phoenix over in a second. Yeah. And I was willing to. I wanted to add value to the match and the crowd, but I was willing to get the shit beaten out of me mm -hmm. because the comeback happens. Mm -hmm. And if we look at all these lows in our lives, like the heat of a match, there's always a comeback. If you allow it. If you allow it. And you know how to right. get there. Yeah. And so like I had to experience that to have learn the gifts and the techniques and share the tools um, to be able to share with everybody. So how are you able to do that with yourself? Because you are now becoming a coach. Yes. Right. Um, and so you're coaching people on how to do that for themselves or how you can help them. Right. Mm -hmm. How are you able to do that for yourself without a coach? I think that's my gift. OK. I think it's my purpose. For my entire life, I've been able to coach people. I mean, maybe 10 years ago it was how to drink some good tequila. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but true. I could get you to drink some good tequila because I believed in it. You won't be hungover. We'll have yeah. a good time. It's a party. Woohoo! Yeah. Right? And when you look back at your life, it's like all this stuff leads up to who you are becoming and evolving into. And so I've done, I think I'm a good coach because I'm a better student. Mm. You know this. I yeah. I train my butt off. Yeah. And I love training. Like, yeah. I will go to seminars and trainings and um, books. Yeah. Like, a crazy fact nobody knows about me is before last year, maybe it's two, year, two years now, I read one book my entire life. Oh, wow. It was called Super Fudge. I think it was in the fourth grade. That okay. book is still available. My, my <laughs> daughter has read it now. I love it. <laughs> and never through my high school, college, really? never read a book. I hated reading. Why? I just couldn't remember it. Like I would read a paragraph and I'd be thinking about what I had to do that day. Like okay. my brain didn't work that way, but I didn't know how to find an alternative. I just thought, I'm not a reader. Okay. And then I heard that statement that the top 1% people in the world read 60 books a year. Yeah. Well, I want to be top 1%, of course. That's what I do. So I better start reading. But I hate reading. So I discovered audiobooks. Yeah. 
And in the last two years, I've probably listened to, on the way here, we live in LA, yeah. so traffic Crazy. is my blessing now. It's right. not a curse. I can listen to a quarter of a book wherever I go. Yeah. So, you know, I've read over like 150 books in two years from wow. one my whole life. I'm 40, by the way. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, yeah. you know, so it's like finding what works for you and how to get yourself out of those situations. And that's been one of my favorite tools. That's awesome. Yeah. That is great. I do appreciate the audiobooks and the podcast and all that. And yeah. the, the time at the gym and uh, getting that in, it's, it's incredible what it does do. And it's kind of like when they say, surround yourself with positive people. Mm -hmm. Well, surrounding yourself with positive books and the message is exactly the same thing. You're surround, even though they're not physical people, yeah. they kind of are because they're, you know, they're in your head giving you positive uh, Well, and what energy. I realize is if you're getting that positive voice, the negative voice is gone. Yeah. So if or I get gets, in the- It gets shut yes, down more yes, and more. Yes, yes, You know, you get in the car and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm nervous. I'm gonna be on Chasing Glory. You just <laughs> reached a hundred episodes. You've had like the biggest superstars on here, right? And then I listen to my book and it's just like, you're good enough. You're just, yeah. you're perfect. You're perfect who you are. Just There's no you. competition, you know? And like that voice rises above. Yeah. All right, so I wanna get to know the Candace Michelle that I've, kind of not ever gotten to know. Oh, this which is, is exciting. Crazy. <laughs> I think about this because how long we've been together. We even formed TLC with Tori yeah. Wilson. By the way, yeah. that's T for Tori, yeah. L for Ryan, <laughs> C for Candace. Um, if you guys didn't figure that out on your own. <laughs> we had some fun. We were even going to do, this has never been publicized. We were even going to do a reality show together. Yes. And that was before Total Divas. That was before it was. all this thing. There was one thing that they were going to throw on the wrench and we all decided it was going to cause a lot of drama. Yep. And we said, nope, that is not what we wanted in our lives. We all said that. So we could, we could have, the three of us, um, could have had our own reality show, but that one wrench we chose above yeah. all that, no, it's not worth it. Yeah. So sometimes you got to make those decisions and I'm still so glad totally. that we didn't do it. Yeah. And Can you not imagine us way. like fighting and throwing mm -hmm. beers on each other? No. Like, Come on. No, we have a beautiful relationship, <laughs> right? and I'm so glad that instead we've empowered each other. Yeah. It's been awesome. All right, so um, I know that you're well, you, growing up in Wisconsin. Yes. I'm like, how long were you there? Or were you there your whole life before you moved to L.A.? Yeah, so I was there until I was 18. Yeah. And then I did, I worked at a roller skating rink. I was big into roller skating. Yeah. Like when I came to California, I was on Venice, you know, doing the tricks and the dancing. Oh, nice. But the roller skating rink had a competition. Do you know this story? I don't think I know the story. So they had a modeling competition and for John Robert Powers. I was 17. Okay. And it was like a gown, a swimsuit, an interview, and whoever won this competition would get a one year contract for John Robert Powers school for free, mm. like the tuition paid. Yeah. And so I'm auditioning, and by the way, my arc enemy is also auditioning, <laughs> yeah. right? So it's like full on competition. Okay. And it comes down to a tie, me and my arc en oh, enemy. Me. Oh my God. And I was like, okay, so since we're at a roller skating rink, the owner decided, why don't we have them have a skate off? Okay. And so we're like, okay, we're both very good skaters. Okay. And so I go out there, and she goes out there and brings her best friend. And so there, when you have like a duel, yeah. things just look better, it's oh. cooler, you can do more, hold hands, more tricks. Right. And so at first I was like, oh, it's just me against two, like that's not really fair. Mm -hmm. And, but I just did me. I went out there, we did our thing, a full song, all of our tricks, and I ended up winning because I chose to do it by myself. Oh, nice. And that's where it all started. I took the school, I went to New York, I was offered some modeling contracts in LA, and at 18, I packed up my car and wow. I drove out here. Awesome. And before we get to that story, I want to go back to Wisconsin. Oh, okay. Let's really go back. Okay. What was life for you in Wisconsin? Ah. I know your dad passed away early. Yeah, I don't know why this is emotional. Um, it was awesome. I never wanted for anything. I was a very good kid. So my dad died when I was one. Mm. Um, 
He had a rare disease of the spine. And he became a quadplegic. Oh, wow. I didn't know this. Thank you. Um, my mom took care of him for a few years. Also while working three jobs. Wow. To support me and my older sister. Well, nothing worked on my dad from the neck down, mm -hmm. except his special part. Okay. Worked. <laughs> okay. I don't know how God made that happen, <laughs> but he did. <laughs> um, and so for a dying wish, he wanted to be with my mom one more time. And that's what and my mom you? got pregnant. Oh, wow. And so the doctors actually urged her to have an abortion because of the disease my dad had and because of the timing of the pregnancy, the likelihood that I would be born with it would be very possible. Um, thankfully, my mom didn't, and I was born just fine. Yeah. And my dad lived till a little under, till I was almost two. Um, How does that make you feel knowing that he wanted this so badly? He wanted you so badly. You know, it's hard to think like you don't have that figure in your life, but I never felt without, ever. Um, my mom did end up remarrying, or she was with a guy for many years who was my stepdad, Ken, who actually got me into the wrestling. Oh, okay. And so, you know, it comes full circle, but there is, when, when you dig so deep, there is just this meaning of this man and it's so funny that how life brings things full circle right so my husband is a chiropractor right. so how random that my dad dies of the most rarest disease of the spine right. and my stepdad's name is Ken and I marry this man named Kenji that's right. a chiropractor it's like my right. dad's like combined you know it's like the yeah. craziest little uh, journey but it definitely, um, it just gives me spirit in my soul. And I realized this a few years ago. I'm not really into psychics or that kind of stuff, but I don't disregard them either. And I heard about actually this chiropractor that's a medium. Okay. And I went to this special circle, and he ends up pulling me forward about um, how my dad wanted to meet me. Mm. And it just felt so authentic, you know, like where you know that there's a spirit in your soul that maybe you never had touched until you just become really raw and vulnerable with that moment. And so it was really special to connect with him for somebody I really don't know at all. Yeah. And so it was really special. Wow. Yeah. So growing up, though, like you said, you, you didn't feel like you were missing a father? No, my, my grandparents slightly raised me. My mom worked three jobs, and so I'd go to school, and I'd go to her house afterwards. But I, I was just so loved. Uh, uh, you know, my mom would work the bars till 2 in the morning. We owned a lot of bars from, from, oh, did you? from Wisconsin. <laughs> Which is why you like the tequila. In every corner. <laughs> um, and, but my mom would work, close the bar at 2 in the morning, always come pick me up from my grandma's, bring me home. I'd have the morning with her. She'd get me to school. And, you know, I, I felt fully loved. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't come from a lot of money, but I never went hungry. Okay. You know, like, yeah. she just fought always. And then she lost her life. Yeah, that one was hard. I was 23, and I, I had um, seen her on Thanksgiving. And when I when I moved to LA, that that part of the story, you know, it sounds so cool. The girl from Wisconsin packed her bags and moved. The reality of that story is, I cried every day for a year. Mm. And I remember calling my mom. And she would always say, you got it, honey. You got it. And as a mom now, 
I pray my kids never leave because I don't know if I could be that strong to say you got it. I'd be like, come home. Mommy's mm. going to take care of you. Yeah. But she just knew, you know. So when I was 23, she came out to visit. I just know she knew I was okay now. Mm. It was the last time I saw her. She had a massive heart attack out of nowhere. Wow. She was 51 years old. Jeez. Um, and it was devastating. Yeah. But like I said, the heat makes for a great comeback if you choose that route, right? Right. And she has made me who I am to this day. I feel her. I love her. I connect with her, you know, and, um, and I miss her. Yeah. Were you in WWE then yet or not? No, you didn't get in there till years later? Can or? you edit all, all my nose blowing? <laughs> 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 or is this the raw part? <laughs> Okay, I, I'm human, guys. I, I cry and blow my nose, too. <laughs> That's right. Um, no, it was right before I got that contract. Okay. Um, that she passed away. Yeah. But that's, a, I feel like, when you, when you live your purpose, which I also feel changes in chapters of your life, right? Yes. But in that chapter, I was like, what would my mom want me to do? What would she want me to succeed at? And life changed for me. You know, it was like, I will do something great because she gave me everything I needed with yeah. nothing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so you have to make those decisions through the pain. It's not easy. Right. But what I, I do know is the latter way is much worse. Yeah. You know, like you're going to feel the pain no matter which route you choose. Right. Why not come out on top? Yeah. You know. Do you feel that without your father and now without her guidance that um, it, you know, kind of like some of the decisions you were making, were they uh, a little rebellious or not or like anything in your life that you the, were lost at any time? The main thing that you lose is that comfort zone that you can always fall back. Yeah. Once you lose your parents who love you unconditionally, even though my mom didn't have a lot of money, she would find a way. Yeah. You know, if I was like, Mom, I can't pay my rent out here, which I never did that, but I knew yeah. in the back of my mind yeah. she would find a way for me. Yeah. I also knew if I needed to go back home, I could go back home. Right. Uh, when I was sad, I could call her. So when you lose that, your only choice is to fall forward. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had to choose. And it's one of the things I talk about in my program, like don't fall backwards. Even if you have the parents and all those people, but fall yeah. forward, fall forward. you know, and fall. I love that. Like it's so great to fall, but <laughs> fall forward and land on your face. Cause you will, right? Yeah. And just get back up. And land on your face again. Yeah. You know? <laughs> this life we, this thing right. we call life, it's crazy. I always tell everybody, we don't have a roadmap. We've never been here before. Right. Right? We're all doing it for the first time, all of us. Yeah. And we're doing the best we can. Yeah. Absolutely. Your sister, how much in, into play in all of this? Because she's an older sister. Yeah. So she's uh, six and a half years <clears throat> older than me. Okay. And... It's funny because I did one of my seminars, and when people ask me about my mom, it's always my perspective, right? Mm -hmm. You know, me getting the phone call. My sister called me, by the way. She mm -hmm. was the one that had to break the news to me. She lives still back in Wisconsin. And I never thought of it from her point of view until I did this seminar. Okay. And it was like, write your lowest moment in your life. And this was my lowest moment was losing my mom. And then he asked, he said, write it by somebody else's perspective that was part of the story. Wow. And that blew me away. Yeah. Like, can you imagine, like, having to call your younger sister to tell that news? Yeah. And so writing from her perspective, like, opened my eyes, and it made me call her to appreciate. I mean, we are, we're very close, but it deepened our relationship. Like, when I could call her and say, 
I have no idea how hard that was for you. Yeah. Like, I never recognized that. We were both mourning, right? Right. And so to think of, like, that additional pain she had to bear for me and slightly take over that role, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't, you don't choose that. Right. It just, all of a sudden, you kind of are given that, you know? As an older sister, she's automatically yeah. assuming, like, oh, my God, I got to step in the mom role. Yeah. And she had a child at the time who was losing the grandma. You know, mm. so you don't think about that stuff unless you're put into different programs or coaching or take that time to, like, discover that. Right. But our relationship from that has just grown. That's awesome. Yeah. Were you guys close when you were growing up? No. No? <laughs> I mean, I was the younger sister in her makeup, you know, yeah. like, sneaking in her room, telling mom that there was a boyfriend in her room, <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> Tattle Taylor. Totally. You know, I was like, anything I could do to get close to her or like sniff out her stuff, you yeah. know. And six and a half years, man. She's, yeah. So, yeah, it's so a, she it's was a gap. Yeah, it was a big gap. Yeah. This is Chasing Glory with Lillian Garcia. Hey guys, all right, we're going to get right back to the show because this interview is fascinating. But I want to tell you about something that is very fascinating, and that is cured nutrition. For weeks, you guys have been hearing me talk about it. It's a CBD company out of Colorado, and they are incredible. I've already, you know, checked their products out. I've already had a lot of people, other people vet them out. So we're bringing you the best CBD company out there. Now, I've talked to you about the spices, and I've talked to you about the hemp oil and the gels and the rise and the zen, but I haven't really talked about this little guy right here. Incredible. It is called Max Sav. And so this is a bomb. If you're hurting, let's say you're working out and you're bruising or you've just sore from working out or you have arthritis, any of that, you can just simply use this as a roll on. Isn't that amazing? You don't even have to put it on your fingers so it doesn't get icky and sticky. So you use it as a roll-on, you put it right on that muscle that is hurting or like I said the bruise or if it's arthritis, you put it right on there, that CBD is going to sink right in, get right in there and just bring you a lot of anti-inflammatory relief. Now what my mom loves about this with her and her arthritis is that she can actually just put it right on her back and she never touches the solution. She says it seeps right on in. It has been wonders for her. So if you yourself aren't necessarily suffering from this, but you know somebody that is, this is a great gift idea. So make sure you go now because I have a discount to all my Chase and Glory listeners. Go to curednutrition.com. Make sure you use the promo code GLORY. That's 15% off your entire order. CuredNutrition.com with the promo code GLORY for 15% off, and you can use that 15% off every single time you shop at CuredNutrition.com. All right, now back to the show. Now, 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 more Chasing Glory with Lillian Garcia. So, growing up, what was your purpose growing up? Was it basketball? Because I've been on the court with you a few times just for fun, <laughs> and you were so good. Well, you did your research. <laughs> You're so uh, good, though. Yeah, basketball was my life. I found just such a love in that game. Yeah. And I learned so much from it, too. I was a freshman, and I was auditioning for the varsity team. Mm. And what happened is my mom had booked a doctor's appointment at one of my practices. So I came to the practice like 45 minutes late. Oh, okay. And, of course, I have an excuse. So I was at... I was like a dental clean, you know, whatever, yeah. some routine thing. And I take it to my coach and you could just see that like a little bit of disappointment in his eyes. Like, why did you book it now? Clearly, I had no choice in that. But I said, uh, coach, what can I do to make up the 45 minutes I was late? And he said, go over to the side and run suicides for 45 minutes. Oof. And if you guys don't know what a suicide oh. is on a basketball court, it's just running from line and back and half court and back and three quarters for 45 minutes. And that's what I did. Did you really? I did. And I made the varsity team. The only freshman at that school to ever make the varsity team. Wow. Yeah. So actually, that was a blessing that you had that yeah, coincidence right? with the dental. Totally. But it gave you the opportunity, right? We always talk about opportunity and yeah. how... We want opportunity to come to us and all. And, and sometimes we think it has to look a certain way. Yeah. And the fact is that it looked so different than what you probably ever totally. thought. But you seized it 
And then you got into the varsity well, and I, team. When I look back, and as you reminded me of my journey, I feel like all those things bring me to my new purpose in life. Yeah. Right? Like, I learned so much. One of the best things that my coach taught me, he said, we practice arete. And arete means excellence in everything you do. Mm. And you have to be good offensively, defensively, physically, you know, cardiovascularly, yeah. cardiovascularly, <laughs> <Lee>. <laughs> yeah. not spellingly. <laughs> um, but I started to grow that mindset way back then. Yeah. And I remember we'd be down sometimes by 10 points and I'd see people on my team that are seniors giving up. Mm. And I always fought to that last second, yeah. right? It's not how about you start, how you finish. Yeah. And those, like now when I look at my career path, I look back and I was like, all these little things had to happen to get me to where I'm going. Yeah. And it just makes life so cool. Awesome. So when did you make the transition, like basketball's done? It was kind of a rough transition. Yeah. It was my senior year. And I won the modeling contract, and I was going to New York. From skating? From skating. Okay. And I was going to New York, and I got a couple offers to move to L.A. And I had to choose between the basketball tournament or the New York wow. competition. Yeah. And I quit basketball. Mm. Because I was like, you know what? What do I want to be? I'm not gonna play for the WNBA. Like it just didn't seem like that was my future, but I thought I would move to LA and do modeling. Okay. And it's worked out. It, it just it <laughs> did. Like, but it's, it's weird out. because it, it's still a love for me. Like I still love to get out on the court, and you know, like I just people always underestimate me. Oh, so I know. Like, That's what I mean. <laughs> when I got out there with you, and I was like, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> but even, you know, it just came up. Like, I remember back then, you know, I talk about always, like, you have to do the reps, right? You yeah. know this. Like, yeah. you're on your 100th episode, right? Yeah. This didn't become successful from day one, day no. two, and it's still growing after doing 100. Right. But I remember laying on the floor in my living room. I'd be watching cartoons, and I would just work on my flick. I'd have the ball in my hand, and I'd do 100. Over oh. and over. I just laid there and did it over and over and over again. Yeah. But it's what made me great. And it's still like I physically cannot throw a bad shot. Like just because that is ingrained in my mind. Right. But it's the reps of that, right? Yeah. It's not just playing the games or the practices. It was going home and laying on the ground and I just sit there. You know, if the ball went over here, my flick wasn't good, you yeah. know? And so you just got to put the work in. So during that time when you were growing up, what would you say then what was the hardest thing that you endured? Hmm. Like what was the struggle back then? I, hon I honestly don't really have a struggle. That's amazing. Like, and that's a testament to my mom because, you know, we didn't come from money and she worked her butt off and I just never felt like I lacked. That's ever. amazing. You know, I really didn't. I got a job when I was 16. You know, I knew the more money I make, the more things I could have or the yeah. night, you know, like I just knew work ethic. I was a good kid. I never drank, ever. Like, I would go to parties I never drank, ever. Mm -hmm. WWE was kind of like my college. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, and when did that start? They and broke me in go. real fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just didn't, I don't feel like I struggled. Yeah. Yeah. So in school, in school and everything, friends, all of that, that was fine? Yeah, it was good. I mean, I wasn't part of a clique, really, because I had my basketball community, which was seniors, and I was a freshman. Yeah. And then I had my best friend that we went to school. And then, actually, it's kind of a really cool story, and I hope maybe she watches this, this podcast because she's reconnected with me. There was a girl in my school, you know, there's always somebody that everybody picks on, right? Yeah. For whatever rhyme or reason. And I just wasn't that person. And I remember actually somebody wrote on the bathroom wall like, Candace is a bitch or something because I wouldn't conform to a clique. Uh. Like I wasn't like, you know, wholeheartedly just like this. Yeah. And I just remember like always saying hi to her and always just being like, how are you? And since then she's reached back out to me through social media and just, she remembered that, Wow. you know? And like, it, just a testament to your character even when you're in high school, yes. you know? And like not feeling like you have to be part of 
Yeah. That bullying, it's bullying, right? But we didn't call it that back then. Right, you know? right. And here I was struggling so hard to be in that click. Yeah. Because I thought that would make me important. Right, right. And then same thing. I saw them one day uh, after struggling and struggling, right, to get in there and then being bullied and not like, accepted. But then I saw them making fun of somebody yeah. um, that was disabled. And I was like, wait a second. Yeah. Why am I working so hard to be a part of a clique that's yeah. making somebody uh, fun of someone who's disabled? Totally. So, yeah, people do remember that. And, well, and, and like nowadays, like I, I see this on social media. Also, I, saw, I think Ashley's daughter actually yeah. posted this saying, I feel like I want to be in there. But I'm not in there, and I don't know how to get in there, and, and you know, this weird thing. But what I want people to understand is that when you be yourself, they'll want to be in with you. Right. You know, and it's hard to understand that at a young age. Yeah. I didn't, I think I knew it, but I didn't have words for it back then. Yeah. But even now, like, it, it comes into our lives now. Like, I'll go to, I remember going to school, my kids first went to school. Yeah. And I was like, I want to hang out with these mommies. But I look very different, you know, <laughs> like I sound different, I act different, I have different views and values. Yeah. How do I fit in but still be in there? Yeah. And then I realized like when I'm myself and I just stand by my own views and values, the people that want to be with you will be with you. Yeah. And it's okay not to have everybody. Right. Because you don't want the people that don't, aren't like-minded, right? Yeah. So, do you think you're um, ever misunderstood? I think I'm misunderstood when I'm not authentically myself. And what I mean by that is I went through this with you. We had a conversation about this recently yeah. where I was like, everybody, when I would post on social media, I'd post a bikini shot, then everybody would like my photos. Yeah. And I went to a seminar. So not all seminars give you proper advice. You should take what works for you. Right. And they're like, this guy's like, post more of whatever people like. Mm. And I was like, okay. So I looked and they don't like the photos of my family and my kids and my husband as much as the bikini shot. So I must post that. But it felt awkward because it's not what I really wanted to post. It's not who I've become. Yeah. Not that I will never post that. Like, I'm proud of what I look like for having three kids, but right. it's a different photo, a different right. kind of bikini photo. And I ran into you at an event, yeah. and uh, this was after Ashley, too. And so I was just really awakening to who I am and who I need to be. And I, I saw Trent Sheldon over there, and he was like, You post who you are. And so people we're just kind of holding on to the old me. And I was too, because I thought that's what my audience liked. Right. But then when I posted the stuff about like the clicks and just really vulnerable, like those people that connected with me, like I spent a couple days just answering messages because it wasn't just like, oh, you look nice, which I appreciate. We all like compliments. It right. makes you feel good. We work hard for what we have, but that like deep, you know, like, hey, can you speak with me? Like, I just connected with those people. Mm -hmm. So you learn from that because I, when we were talking about that, that Trent said you might lose yes. some of your old followers, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Yeah. But you're gonna gain some new followers that are gonna be all about who you are, who yeah. authentically are. And I think that that's a huge lesson right now because social media is a scary thing. Like it's a mm -hmm. great thing, but it's a really scary thing because we're letting it measure who we are. Yeah. You know, we're letting it also dictate who we are. Like it was with you talking about that, saying that, well, I must post all these bikini mm -hmm. shots and all this kind of, you know, all, you know, less dressed and whatever yeah. so that I can get likes. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, the more likes I get, the more better I'm doing or the more people like me. Right, right. Isn't it funny? Like people think like a like is like all of a sudden you have a new friend. Yeah. Like these people don't, they don't, don't know, know you. you. <laughs> but when you're like really vulnerable and yeah. you get a like or a comment, I was like, that person knows me. Yes. Like that person I would be a friend with. Yeah. You know? So now you're feeling better on your new yeah. transition. Yes. And, transition. and it was a transition of just, and it's just growing, you know, and, and learning and discovering that stuff and who I am and just posting what I want to post. Also yeah. for me, 
it's not about algorithms or how much I post. Like, I know that stuff will get you more followers. But there was a point where you look at people that you once work with, you know, and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, she's got a million followers and she's got, I don't know what you have, like 500,000 and why do I have 70, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's true to the work that I put into it. Like I have my kids at home and I have to choose my time wisely yeah. on what I can put into what and what makes me feel good and what makes my life purpose proper, you right, know? And right. that's very different from yours and our friends like Tori and, you know, everybody else. And so it's just about being confident in your own yeah. person, yeah. Yeah. you know? But you have to grow, I had to grow into that. Right, and not worry and, about the numbers. And, and know who I changed into yeah. and discover it. Yeah. I didn't know either, you know? So you're feeling better. No, so much better. So much better. Yes. It seemed a whole lot better. Your transition into WWE, like how did it go from modeling into WWE and the uh, the diva search, the good old diva search? Yeah, so I was uh, <laughs> I was doing modeling in LA, and my agent calls me and he said, "Hey, Candace, I'm not sure if you're interested in this." He was like the surfer dude that lived by the beach. It's like, but WWE is having this diva search contest. The winner will win a hundred thousand dollars in a one year contract, and I was like. Now, I mean, you know my story. I grew up watching WWF every Monday night with my stepdad, Ken. We loved it. Went to the shows. I had a Hulk Hogan doll instead of a Barbie doll. So I'm like, this is amazing. Like, I'm yeah. athletic. It's like acting and modeling all in one. Yeah. I'm their girl. And I auditioned. And as you and a lot of people know, I think I was cut in the top 10, maybe eight or right around there. Mm -hmm. And being in the industry, you know, we're cut from things all the time. It's just the right. nature of our business. But that one hurt. Yeah. So I was like, I'm perfect for that. You know how you just, you know, maybe maybe I wasn't the perfect winner, but I was perfect for that company. And so about a month later, they called me and they offered me the contract. So you didn't pursue it after you got cut? I just thought it was the end. Ah, you know, like... I thought you kind of went after it. No. This whole time, no. I thought you had contacted them going... No, I must be here. <laughs> well, and you know, from my childhood, it was a business that I never knew you could train for or be in. You know, that yeah. was, there was a lot of issues coming in where the, the I call them us the Hollywood girls, coming into the girls that grew up on the indie scene. Or yeah. not grew up, but trained on the indie scene. Right. Like, I never knew that existed. To me, it was like, these are superhero cartoon characters. <laughs> like, how do you become that character? Like, right. it was just like... Something I didn't know how you go after. Right. And even then, you know, it's like, oh, this is great. But then when I was released, I was like, or I'm just done. Yeah. You know? And so when Johnny called me, I think it was about a month or a couple of weeks later, yeah. and then offered me a three year contract, I was just like, okay, over it's the on. moon, right? It's on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how does it feel like 2007, you know, Pro uh, Wrestling Illustrated named you as the most improved and also woman of the year? That was awesome um, because once again, what people don't see, like they always think like when you get that, oh, maybe it's her looks or maybe Vince likes her right now or she's gifted or she's talented or she's lucky. Mm -hmm. like, these things don't exist in life, so whoever thinks that, I would go to the arena two hours early on house shows because I was never trained. And I'd get in there as they're setting the ring up, and I'd get in there with the refs. Mm -hmm. And I would learn, and I would learn, and I'd come home, and I paid $3 to rent this ring that had broken down chicken coops, yeah. and the boards were broken, and I'd get in there and train. And it's all those things that literally I was the most improved. Yeah. Like, you know, people always want to take that title away or that award away or that, you know, that prize. And it's like, no, I, I earned that. I literally put in the work for that. And yeah. so that was awesome to be honored for that. What was your biggest highlight besides the 24-7 title? <laughs> you said it's your favorite. What was your biggest hi um, highlight when you were there full time? The, my biggest highlight was when I was in my storyline with Beth Phoenix, and there was a point where it was going so good. It was when I really grasped the philosophy of a wrestling match. 
Because when you come in from Hollywood, they don't train you on anything. <laughs> yeah. Not no, even to go around and shake people's hands. No, no, <laughs> you're yeah, on your own. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like you figure everything out. There's yeah. no like protocol. There's no going to TV beforehand. It's like there's no human resources. You to the walls. Take, yeah, taking you around. <laughs> here's this. Here's yeah. this. No. <laughs> and so you know, somebody said there at the company they were pretty high up, and they said. You know, basically, if you can work here, you can work anywhere. Yeah. And it's true. It does it set you up to be able to handle anything, which is cool. It's I mean, I contribute being a great mom to my wrestling career. There you go. Like, I never slept. You know, <laughs> I dealt with crazy people all the time. It's like, I have three crazy kids and I don't sleep ever. <laughs> you know, like, I'm a great mom. <laughs> The highlight, about? right? Oh, yeah. So. The Phoenix. So, yeah. So, obviously, I had no idea what a the philosophy of a wrestling matches. And I actually remember when I was working a little bit with Trish Stratus. Yeah. And I was like, I can do that. Like she made it look so easy. <laughs> yeah. Right? But it was so easy because she put in so much work. Right. But I didn't know that at the time. Like, well, I can do that too. Like this is easy. And I didn't give her the respect that she probably deserved at that time mm. because I thought I could do it too. Mm -hmm. And then you get in there and you're like, Whoa. <laughs> and then when you get the philosophy, that's when the crowd gets it. Yeah. And that was the moment when Arn Anderson and Ricky Steamboat saw what Beth Phoenix and I were creating. Mm. And they came to us. It was a house show overseas. And I remember them, you know, they were the top agents. Yeah. And they left some of the top matches to come work our match. Wow. And really explain, because they were heel and baby face, really explain that concept to us. And that's when it clicked for me. Can you share a little bit of that concept? Yeah, you know, it's really, really for me as the baby face for her, you know, being the smaller one to um, a more glamazon character, I had to be willing to sell everything she did to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what made me the underdog. It's what made me want people want to fight for me. Right. You know, and what I don't think the wrestling fans totally grasp in words, they grasp in feeling and heart. Right. Is that we're all the underdog at some point, and we all so desperately want the comeback. Right. And so when I am down so bad because literally she could beat the crap out of me. Yeah. And if I have any fight or flight left, yeah. it's like they're like, hey, I can do that at my job. I can do that at my school. Like maybe not the words come to their mind, but that feeling. Yeah. So that's why, you know, it has billions of people that watch. It's like it's not just the storyline. It's the hope and, and the concept and the philosophy that you can put in your life. Yeah. And so that's when it's brilliant. You know, when the audience feels that, you feel it. Yeah. And, and to get to a point in the match where it wasn't scripted, where Beth and I were listening to what the audience wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, like, how long is she going to hold me in that hold? You know, like, when is that audience going to get behind me? Yeah. And it, that's not given. You don't just walk out and they love you or hate right. you. Like, you work for all of it, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know? And so that's when it becomes really special. How good did that feel for you, like with the audience? Like talk to me about what the audience means to you. Like put yourself back in that ring when they are, because I, I, I can feel yeah. like you're feeling <laughs> yeah. it. You're feeling it, you're the remembering is, that. Is our fans don't just give it to you. Right. And at first that sucks. Because you want to walk out there and feel what the top stars feel. You know, you want to feel what Stone Cold Steve Austin feels when he comes out there, you know? Right. And when you come out there, they're just analyzing you. Like, who is she? What is she going to do? Does she care? Is she just here for a moment? Like, they, they're figuring you out. Yeah. And when it's like you become one it's you know it's almost like avatar right you yeah. know and they put the tail in it's like that connection is just on fire and like i remember even arn saying look at one person mm. and like that changes the dynamic of everything and so i'd be in the hold and i would just find that one person oh really and we'd connect and i'd fight for that person oh wow and 
when I fight for that person, it's like I'm fighting for whatever dream they have too. Yeah. And it's not said in words, but it's the feeling yeah. that I or they can never forget. And it's powerful. That is so awesome. Yeah. Because I always think like you look at the sea of people and you don't really notice that one. Yeah. So to know that he was telling you to hone in on that one. Yeah. Is, I've never heard anybody in wrestling talk about that. Yeah. So that's awesome. Wow. So how hard for you or how hard was it for you when you got injured? Because it was with Beth Phoenix. You broke your yes. clavicle, right? Um. Weirdly enough, I don't think it was that hard. And that's hmm. kind of strange to say. I mean, I remember rehabbing, and then I got injured again and again. So it was like these three injuries. Yeah. And then I, I was at sports club, a, a workout facility here, and working out. And that's when I got the call. It's like, I just knew it was coming. The call. The call. You know, oh, Talk the call. Talk about the call. <laughs> My favorite call. Um, when, you know, WWE calls and say, you know, we've come to terms and we're going to release you from your contract. I remember calling my husband and I told him, I was like, so do you want to have babies? Really? <laughs> and he's like, well, it's not like don't want pepperoni on my pizza. Can we talk about this tonight? I was like, yeah, I guess that's okay. Is that what you really did? Uh, really, that like, like word so for you. word, you know? Because he had kind of started to want that a little yeah. bit and I was just so in my career. And so it was just perfect timing and... And I knew what I wanted right away. Uh, there definitely a transition, of course. Yeah. But because I was so also good with my money, you know, I had I had a lot of really big opportunities like GoDaddy and Playboy. Yeah. And I saved that so I wasn't um, stressed. Yeah. You know, my husband's career was just starting to take off, so I, I just felt like the timing was perfect and then transition sucks you know yeah. like figuring it out but once you become a mom like you can't think about anything else yeah. <laughs> like you know yeah. it's a whole nother transition wow well you brought up GoDaddy, and i have to touch oh. on that yes. you know before we end this for sure tell me how you got that offer with mm -hmm. GoDaddy, and the fact that you i mean you were the first first go daddy girl yeah and those were some controversial, <laughs> you know, Super Bowl ads. And some of them were said that they were not going to air and yes. all that good stuff. So the way I got the audition was I went on a normal audition. And it was actually via satellite, which was my first satellite what? audition. So back then, that was, I think, kind of unheard of. Yeah. And so the owner of GoDaddy was going to be on a big TV over here. And they would ask me some questions. And... It was just improv. They wanted me to improv all my answers. And I was very fun and goofy. And um, gratefully, I landed the job. I mean, they auditioned in New York, Chicago, Miami, and L.A. So wow. it was this massive audition. I was one of the last to audition. And then I show up to my first Super Bowl commercial shoot. <laughs> Now, the night before, I'm so stoked, right? So yeah. I'm preparing. I got all my stuff mm -hmm. laid out, extra makeup, hair, you know, whatever I need. I put on a mask and take a bath. I go to <laughs> bed early, and I wake up sick. Oh. Like, sick. Like, flu sick. Oh, no. Like, I have no idea how that can even happen. Wow. Right. And I go there, and I'm blowing my nose and sneezing and oh, coughing. Oh, God. And the poor makeup artist is on me, like, every second. Yeah. And I just, you know, you got to do what you got to do. You got to push through it all. Was this the one where your, um, your the shoulder, strap, yes. the strap, yes. right? And this was kind of like a mock-up of what had happened to Janet Jackson. Right. Right. So okay. when this, so the controversy is actually not so controversial, but I think Fox and TV for making it so controversial <laughs> is we actually bought two spots in the Super Bowl. And so after the first one aired, they were very distraught that we did this improv of, you know, the parody the year before. And so they didn't play the second one. Uh -huh. Now, when you pay millions of dollars for that spot, any owner or executive expects their commercial to be played. Right. And so that's what made it so controversial. So the same commercial was just supposed to air twice. Got and it. And it didn't. Got it. And I remember waking up the next morning, and I had like 60 voicemails. So I was like, <laughs> who 
who died. <laughs> like I was so worried to listen. Right. And everybody wanted an interview, interview, interview. Oh. Like it was like the most, the craziest thing. Like it was like you, I got a big break. Like right. you don't even think that's real. And it was real. I was like, I did nothing but do my commercial. <laughs> yeah. And somebody didn't play it. And now I'm a superstar. <laughs> did you have, did you do a lot of the, the press? Yeah, I did okay. all of it. I did mean, it? It, it was intense. It was incredible. But I mean, you know, when you're doing interviews in New York and London, and but from California, you're just up all night, right? You know, from the time changes and right. But it was an incredible journey. And I mean, what what were they asking? Like basically, what you felt like the fact that it got pulled from the air? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, and like you, why was it so like what you're asking? Like why was it so controversial? It was just a strap. <laughs> I was like, it was just a strap. Like it was no, but. You know, it's the it's the the idea. The idea they wanted to, right. you know, kind of get away from what happened. Um, I think obviously Fox got in so much trouble for airing. That. I guess Janet they didn't Jackson. check it. I, well, well, I mean, your commercial, they didn't check it well, ahead of time. And the weird maybe thing, I believe that everything submitted beforehand. You think so, so, right? Yeah. But it it's one of those things. Also, I believe like if you just go into your path. Those things happen when they need to happen. Yeah. Like, that was nothing like crazy, right? right? right. It's not like my nipple came out. <laughs> I mean, my strap popped off, right. you know? I mean, I did Playboy. That's way more controversial right. than right. my strap. Right. And it's just God's plan. You know, you move yeah. forward in your purpose and your direction, and he'll make highlights along the way saying, yes, this is the way to go. Or he makes lowlights saying, go the other way, right. Right. you know, right. and just... We gotta look for those. Yeah, you bring up religion right now because you were just speaking about the good old oh, God. Yeah. Um, I know that you've been, you've had God and faith and everything. Yes. By your side, and it's it's helped you a lot, right? Yeah. Um, what do you feel? Because again, you've been a Playboy, you've done the the controversial yeah. GoDaddy, um, McKinsey, Montgomery. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Talk to me about all of that as far as how does that, in your eyes, fit with faith? Because faith yeah. to some people means like strict and you yeah. know, nothing that is sexual. But you're, you're a very sexual human yeah. being. Yeah, no, I don't believe in like a lot of rules attached to religions. Um, I think that people attach rules to religions. I also... Like, I was raised Christian. I went to a Lutheran school. That is my, I guess, main denomination. But I also believe in all denominations. Like, I don't think being a Jew is bad or a Buddhist or a higher power, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I do believe that you need a higher power mm-hmm. um, spiritually. Like, I, I feel sad for people that believe in nothing. Right. Um, and I find them to be sad usually. Now, that is just a generalization that I'm making, but all the steps that I've done, once again, they're part of my journey. And I am not proud of all of them. But like foot modeling, when I was broke living in LA, paid $500 for an hour. Mm. That's a lot of money (laughs) for a girl that has no money living in LA. Like that could pay my rent for a month. And for me, I I wasn't, I'm not ashamed of it. What I say is, the thing I want on my resume, no. But did I learn from it? Of course. You know, mm-hmm. like I also, you know, I have a Skin and Max movie that somehow is out there. And that was a big learning lesson for me. I actually was pitched that this was a full on movie on HBO, not on Skin and Max. And I had a whole script. I had eight scenes of like full-on lines that were memorized yeah and then there was one intimate scene yeah and they cut and edited everything out oh wow and so what i thought i was getting into was very different than what came out but once again a huge learning lesson you know so is it something i want to say i'm proud of no but also once i have kids and things are on the internet those things are going to come out, Yeah, you know? Even my daughter had a sleepover recently, and one of her friends was like, you're on the cover of Playboy. And I was like, how do you even know what that is? Like, this is up in my house, like, yeah. by our bar area. My kids have never said anything about this, you right, know? Right, right. Um, but I'm not ashamed of it. Like, and Playboy for me was a dream. Yeah. And 
and a great story behind that too. Did would you want to, your kids to follow suit and do the same thing? Your girls? I want them to do their dreams. Okay. And for me, I viewed Playboy as the 12 most beautiful people in the world a year get to grace Playboy. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the image of a woman's body to me is very beautiful. I know there's a sexual element to it and some men use it for other avenues, but that's not what it means to me. Mm-hmm. And actually to share a quick story i first had done their special edition so i did some college edition which i was never in college but (laughs) (laughs) um and i remember the makeup artist saying to me once you do these you can never be in the main magazine oh and i felt devastated because it was a dream for me oh wow to be a playboy centerfold what did it mean for you it meant to me that i was one of the most beautiful women in the world and at that stage in my life, that was... You needed that? It's what I, I don't know if I needed it. It's what I wanted. You know, like I strived for that. You know, maybe it was an, an acclamation of what I was striving for. I don't know. But I, I did dream of that. It wasn't like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. It was, it was a dream of mine. Mm-hmm. And when she said that, I was slightly devastated. Like, wow, can I not have that? And then to push beyond that and not just be a centerfold, but to grace the cover as a celebrity, which by the way, you make like 10 times more money on the cover, Yeah, was just like, don't let anybody tell you uh. what walls you can break down and what walls you can't, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And so it's that's a great journey for me. And it's something I will share with my kids when they're ready and, and everything will be shared with them regardless. So it's yeah. how do I look at those experiences? Yeah. And how can I share my failures with them so that they don't have to live through that, Mm -hmm. right? I love that. And actually we do this every day um, with my kids. You know, we we say what we're thankful for, but what's more important to me is I say, what did you fail at today? Mm. And if you don't fail at something, you're not trying hard enough. Mm -hmm. And it creates this relationship with my kids that they're okay with failing. Okay. And the more you fail, the more you succeed. Love that. Wow. And if you just go, you know, mediocre, yeah. you, you didn't try anything in that day. Yeah. But then if they, like, they're serious into gymnastics, when they can't get a back handspring, they're not devastated because they're like, I failed. I got to try again. I gotta, mm. You know? And mm-hmm. so failure doesn't become this life-ending thing for them. Yeah. This bad thing. Yeah. I love that. Case. Yeah. I love it. All right. As we wrap this up, um, talk to me about this program that you have coming out. So excited for you. I'm really excited about it. It's called 21 Day Champ Challenge. I have created 21 tools in 21 days, 21 quotes of my own, never heard before, and 21 signature moves. This is very wrestling orientated because, like I was saying with the heat of the match and why I feel we really connect with the fans, Yeah. I wanted to integrate wrestling lingo with all of this. And the best part is I don't tell you what to do, but I will be your tag team partner. Okay. So every day for 21 days, I will do the challenges that I give you. So you'll get a really pretty video of me telling you the challenge, the quote, the signature move, and the top rope risk. And then that day I'll do the challenge and you'll get a raw video to see how did I succeed at it? And more importantly, how did I fail at it? Mm. So that you, and everybody sees that when you're a champion, like you really fail so much. Yeah. And if I can cut the fat off for you and say, you should probably do it this way because this way didn't work. Like, yeah. let me cut the fat off for you. I love that. You know, and so it's a great journey. My heart and soul is into it. That's it's going to be super affordable, available to everybody. When does it come out? It's going to come out September 1st. All right. It's been filmed for a while and ready to go. But this is a great lesson. I have an Achilles heel and it's technology. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to like just pay somebody to do this and just say, you put it up here, make it look so pretty and have this beautiful studio. And it's like, I need to do it. Mm. And so I found myself going to Apple and sitting down for a basic computer class and learning how to cut and paste and get my videos into the program. My God, I just get it done. And it sucks, Love but it. we yeah. got to do the reps. Love so it. So it's coming out finally. Wow. Yeah. 
I want to thank you for this, and I'm going to thank you for as open as you were and as vulnerable as you were, sharing everything. It's been a beautiful, just sitting here listening to your journey. Thank you. It's been great. And thank you for allowing me to be on here. And also, I want to say this, for allowing me to be on here at a perfect time. Because when you have friends that are doing things and succeeding, sometimes people just have expectations like, hey, why haven't I been on your show, right? <laughs> and quite honestly, you ask those. We're human, right? Yeah. And you ask those things. But it's when you put in the work and it's the right timing that yeah. makes it so valuable. And so it's a testament to who you are and what you do. And... Um, Thank you. Allowing me to be here. Aww, I love sweet. you. I love you, darling. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Lastly, just let everybody know how they find you on social media so they can follow oh, you. Oh, yes. Uh, please find me. I am, Right now, I'm Mrs. underscore Candace underscore Michelle. <laughs> We've got to fix that. I'm trying to change this desperately, but it's yeah. very difficult. Um, that's Instagram. I'm very live on Instagram, which so if you want to really connect with me, please go there. Facebook is Candace Michelle. I post everything there through Instagram and my website coming up. But awesome. Yeah, find awesome. me. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Chasing Glory with Lillian Garcia. Wow. Okay. Like, I didn't know all those things about Candace Michelle. Uh, Candace, man, first of all, thank you so much for being so vulnerable with us. Um, man, you made me cry. God, it's just the story and the way that you got conceived. That's crazy. But to know that your dad wanted you that bad, where he wanted to leave that before he, he left this world is, um, geez, that's touching. That's, uh, that's amazing. But it shows you, it shows you what you are and who you are. And I love that you're so authentic. So thank you for being who you are. I wish you nothing but success with the program. And guys, if you're interested, you make sure you go to our social media and it tells you exactly how to uh, get part of that program. She's already starting to do some things on social media and then officially September 1st, it comes out. Until then, make sure you follow the show at Chasing Glory Podcast on Instagram, at Lillian Garcia on Instagram and Twitter, Lillian Garcia official fan page on Facebook. We also have ChasingGloryPodcast.com. We have the Chasing Glory app, so you can just follow the show that easy. And definitely watch the show when we come to video like this, and that is YouTube.com slash Lillian Garcia. Just make sure you spell Lillian with one L. Okay, in the meantime, have an amazing, amazing week. Go out there and live with much peace, love, and passion. And remember to always be yourself and trust that it's enough. Don't forget to watch PFL this Thursday. Love you guys. Bye. Thanks for joining us here on Chasing Glory from executive producer Lillian Garcia. Don't forget to share this episode with your friends. And be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows.